Sutra. Then the world on it one wishing to restate this meaning spoke verses saying, Commentary. Then Shakyam knew the world on it one knew that Anada had still not understood the answer to his question. Wishing then to restate this meaning, he spoke verses saying, Verses have a fixed number of syllables in each line, perhaps five, six, or seven in the Chinese. Sutra. In the true nature, conditioned things are empty. They spring from causes as illusions do. Things unconditioned neither rise nor cease. Unreal they are like flowers in space. Commentary. In the true nature, that is, in the absence of any falseness, a falseness nonetheless relies on the true nature to come into being. Thus, conditioned things arise out of true emptiness, but the conditioned dharmas are empty. They spring from causes as illusions do. Conditioned dharmas arise when certain conditions are present, but once conditions arise, they will also cease to be. Thus, the fundamental substance is emptiness. That's why it's said to be like an illusion. Things unconditioned neither rise nor cease. You say that conditioned dramas are empty. What about conditioned dramas? Are they empty too? Yes, they are not born and do not become extinct. Wouldn't you call them neither rising nor ceasing emptiness? Unreal they are like flowers in space. They don't have a substantial nature. They are not real, just like the strange flowers in space. Sutra, to speak of the false is to reveal the true. But both the false and the true are false themselves. If there is neither truth nor untruth, how can there be perceiver and received? Commentary to speak of the false is to reveal the true. Why do we talk about falseness? It is in order to manifest all that is true. But true and false are opposites, and so they are not ultimate dramas. In the Song of Enlightenment, the great master Yung Cha says, When the true is not set up, the false is basically empty. When both existence and non-existence are dispelled, that what wasn't empty is made empty. There isn't any true. The false is basically empty, but the true doesn't exist either. Thus, to be called, was to be called true, the true does not remain nor is there any existence or non-existence. You have to make empty what is not empty. This is the same principle. The false is spoken to reveal the true, but the true and the false that you speak about are both false. They are not true. If they were true, how could there be a false among them? There isn't anything at all. That is the Dharma realm of truth emptiness. It is the one true Dharma realm and the Dharma realm of true suchness. In it, not a single Dharma is established. As soon as I used to speak about the true by comparing it to falseness, then the true becomes false. The true referred to is no longer fundamental truth. Both are false because they are opposites. At its ultimate point, Buddhism is absolute. There are no dualities. True and false are still at the level of opposites and in the realm of duality. The true which is the opposite of the false is itself false. If there is neither truth nor untruth, the Buddha explains that it appears to be true, but that it is not fundamental truth. As soon as a name is applied to it, it becomes a secondary truth, not the primary truth. How can there be perceivable and perceived? How can you say there is a subjective perceiver and an object perceived? The, the subjectivity of the seeing division and of the six defining objects, the appearance with division, which is what is perceived, cannot be spoken of because they do not exist. Sutra, between them the two in fact have no nature. Thus, they are likened to intertwining, um, entwining reeds, the north and 
that release have a common cause. The sages and ordinary pupils paths are not two. Commentary between them the two, in fact, have no nature. In the midst of the true and the false, the six organs, the six objects, and the six consciousnesses, there is no nature that actually exists. Thus, they are likened to entwining reeds through knots, and their release have a common cause. When you do not understand, you get tied up in knots and cannot undo them. When you understand and obtain liberation, you know that the cause of both the knots and their release was the same. Lack of understanding is the knots, understanding is the release. The sages and ordinary people's paths are not two. Holy people and ordinary people don't tread separate paths. A sage is someone who understands the principle of things he has fathomed the measured space of the entire universe and thus has a sage, sage wisdom. An ordinary person, when he does not understand, turns his back on enlightenment and unites with the defilements of the world. So, an ordinary person turns his back on enlightenment and unites with the dust. A sage turns his back on the dust and unites with enlightenment. If you renounce enlightenment, you become one with the defining appearances of conditioned dramas. But basically, the sage and the ordinary person are not on different roads. Why aren't their paths different? One is confused and the other has awakened. But the source of confusion and enlightenment is one. Here we are speaking of ultimate dramas. Sweep away all dramas, separate from all appearances. Sutra regard the nature of the intertwined emptiness, existence, and both are not. Dark confusion is simply ignorance. Bringing it to light is liberation. Commentary Ananda regard the nature of the intertwined. We need please and mind the intertwining reeds, especially the nature that lies between them. The nature do the intertwining reeds have? What nature do the intertwining reeds have? None at all. There is neither emptiness nor existence in evidence. Emptiness, existence, both are not. They, you may say that is empty. Yet there is something there. You may say that it exists, but in fact it doesn't. The intertwining rays represent the non-existent quality of both conditioned and unconditioned dramas. You should understand this. Dark confusion is simply ignorance. This means that with a reference to your six sense organs, when you do not understand and you have not yet awakened, you are confused about true emptiness. A darkness grows in the emptiness. That's where ignorance comes from. In the pure nature and bright substance of your everlasting true mind, confusion grows into ignorance. Bringing it to light is liberation. If you discover this, there is no ignorance. You discover your inherent enlightened nature. This discovery is just liberation. In the past, there was a monk of the Chen school who heard about an enlightened high song hunt with a virtual in the way. He went to request instruction from him. In Buddhism, asking for instruction is a very formal affair. It isn't just a matter of tossing out a casual question and getting a, a casual answer back. Since the instruction is given for the sake of any birth and death, the whole matter is looked upon quite seriously. It's necessary to put on your robes and the sash and take your sitting cloth with you. When you arrive in the master's presence, you completely open out your sitting cloth, spread it on the ground, bow three times, and then kneel erect on both knees with your palms together. Then you can ask about whatever you don't understand. What did the monk ask? He wanted to know how to obtain liberation. 
he thought really is, how could he get free? This was his question to the superseded one, that is, to the Sanghan who had held the princess for a long time. One whose general status among the Sanghan was a long standing. The monk asked, If you please, superseded one, how can I become liberated? The elder Sanghan retorted, Who's tying you up? With that one sentence, the monk asking for instruction became enlightened. Was it really just that one sentence that caused his enlightenment? Yes and no. How can that be, you wonder? Almost always a situation can be looked at from both sides and explained in more than one way. Isn't that just being elusive for a week? No, not if you can really speak to the principle involved. In this case, we can say that it was just one sentence that brought about the monk's enlightenment because the old cultivator who said it had looked into the causes and conditions that had brought among the monk to the point of asking for liberation. He knew that his answer was tying you up would give the monks an immediate understanding, an enlightenment. Therefore, he chose to answer in that way. Even so, there are times when a person doesn't become enlightened, even though one wants him to. This time, however, we can say that the old cultivator was successful with his sentence and that he enabled a student of Chen to obtain enlightenment. On the other hand, how can it, it be explained that it was not just that one sentence that brought about the monk's enlightenment. Ordinarily, that monk cultivated on a daily basis to develop his skill in meditation. He'd been cultivating for a long time, but still had not had a breakthrough. Even so, every day he worked on it and every day his wisdom grew. He had naturally become enlightened, but he was close. Then, the one sentence that the superior city Sanghan spoke was opportune and he suddenly became enlightened. He encountered the mixing and uniting of causes and conditions, and so as soon as the high Sanghan pointed the way, he understood there is a saying, Sitting ten years in contemplation alone in the mountain wise isn't as good as a slight indication given by a bright advisor. A bright advisor means a bright-eyed advisor, that is, someone who has opened the Buddha eye, a good knowing one like this, can look into causes and conditions. He speaks dramas that are caught with the point to which your causes and conditions are developed. So, you may sit 10 years in the mountains, but it won't much having a bright eyed advisor point out a bright path to you. Therefore, drawing near to a good and wise advisor is very important in Buddhism. Among elder monks, there are very, very few who are genuine bright-eyed advisors. They may be good and wise advisors, but not necessarily bright-eyed. That is, they may not have opened their five eyes. You should not think this is such an easy thing to do either. Opening the Buddha eye is certainly not the same as certification, so the fruition of a hardship, but it does require that you have gurus in past lives. To be able to open the Buddha eye, one has to have single-mindedly cultivated the dramas of great compassion, specifically the 42 greatly compassionate hands and eyes. If you have cultivated this earnestly, you can open the Buddha eye, that is a drama that gets you through the gate. If a person who has opened the Buddha eye lives the whole life, he or she can save a lot of things. But it all depends on causes and conditions. Those of you who would like to open the Buddha eye should be extremely rigorous in your cultivation of the 42 hands and eyes. Never miss a day in your practice. And most important, you can't smoke cigarettes if you cultivate this dharma. If you try to do both, the Dharma protecting good spirits will reprimand you. So don't stop me about it. 
I hope every one of you will be very attentive to the practice of the 42 hands and eyes. Never miss a day, and even at that, it will take several years of skill before you have any success. If you have cultivated them in previous lives, then your progress will be more rapid. You will open the wisdom eye very quickly.